Okay, so um, I hope that you're not too hungry uh, for another hour. Um, but we're going to talk about energy, um, which is an important topic as well. And I got to say that um, the Western Balkans have always been very close to my heart, and I miss the last panel. But anyway, energy is really important, and it also is related to all our neighbors, be, be them candidates or not. Now, um, we have a pretty interesting title of our panel, which is Beyond the Pipeline, Not the Future of the Energy Sector in the Wider Europe Region. It's a really broad issue, but I guess that we could uh, go into more details and put things into context. Uh, context. I'd like to uh, first give the floor to Mr. Julian Popov uh, for a brief introduction, and then we'll go forward. Thank you for staying, really. Thank you. Thank you, Delina, and thank you, everybody, for staying. Uh, it, it's been... <clears throat> Very interesting day, so I don't know how we will manage to entertain you to a level to keep you awake and to forget that you're hungry and there is dinner later, but uh, we'll, we'll try our best. So um, we will talk about energy, but um, the perspective to which we should see energy is... Uh, Mm, how uh, energy impacts the um, foreign policy and uh, security policy. So I will say a few words about energy security, just as a start. Um, and I would like to start, start with three points. Um, so I number them so that we can remember things so this very tired moment. So when we talk about energy security, I think it's very important to understand that energy security, it is not about gas. So if we look at or listen to various speeches, read articles and so on, we uh, constantly mix energy with gas. Ask somebody to, to talk about uh, energy security and they start talk about gas. Ask somebody to talk about gas, they start talking about energy, thinking that gas and energy is the same thing. So, I will give you three numbers that um, uh, I think support this point. And because we are talking in a framework of a, some kind of a European process, you know that the European Union, the European Commission loves round numbers. So, there are 10, 20, and 2,000. You can try to remember. 10 is the uh, Bulgarian dependence, 10% is the Bulgarian dependency on gas. That's it. Well, sometimes it's 12, but 10 is the round number. So, so in fact, we always say Bulgaria is 100% dependent on Russia. Well, it's not. It's 10% dependent on Russia in terms of gas. The rest, well, let's leave nuclear fuel uh, away, but the rest is uh, international trade commodities. And this 10% we can easily reduce. The other thing is 20%. 20% is what Eastern Europe, which is really the, um, the eastern part of the European Union, that Eastern Europe, the new member states, this is what the gas consumption of the Eastern Europe compared to the overall EU consumption is. So Eastern Europe, which is the, the most vulnerable, exposed to Russia and so on uh, land, consumes 20% 20, 20 of the gas in uh, Europe. And the third, 2000, is... Uh, linked to the fact that gas consumption in Europe is declining. So we're at the moment at the level of consumption of gas of year 2000. So if you ask somebody, if you have asked somebody three years ago, well, gas consumption is falling, everybody would say, yes, of course, economic crisis. The economic crisis is over, 
Economy started growing, gas consumption started falling, continued to fall. Uh, there are no uh, reliable predictions what's going to happen. That's why I can offer very sort of guess that they will continue to fall. The reason why gas consumption in Europe is falling is uh, first the energy efficiency policies are becoming more and more and more effective and spreading everywhere. And the other is the growth of renewables. Uh, these two things should not be um, underestimated. They have massive impact. They almost, they killed one of the biggest German energy companies. They almost killed another one, RWE. Several energy companies in Europe were forced in the last few years to announce dozens of gigawatts of uh, generation capacity to be closed. So that will continue. So this is the, the first thing, that it's not about gas. Gas wants very much to be about gas. So, and gas countries, Russia and other gas countries are constantly pushing this story. Gas, 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 but it's not about it. Um, the second thing that I would like to say is that I think it's, it's quite important to see the region from the territory between Iran, Iran is a very trendy place now, uh, between Iran and Italy as a one coherent region. When we talk about Southeast Europe, we always talk about Western Balkans, new member states, there are old member states in Southeast Europe as well. Then there is Bulgaria and Romania always trying to be different but never succeeding quite. And then there is Turkey, it's a different thing. There is Cyprus, which is some kind of an alien planet. Nobody knows where exactly it is exactly. But in fact, this is a one <coughs> region, especially when it comes from, uh, to, to energy mm, matters. And it is very important from energy security and security uh, point of view uh, to be treated as a one coherent region. Then things make sense. And the third thing is that energy security is not about resources, it's about markets. So it doesn't really matter, do we have gas or we don't have gas? Well, if we don't have gas, what we need is a market for gas. What we need is a market for electricity. And because it's not about gas and it's more about electricity, and especially sitting in Bulgaria, the country probably which has the largest uh, electricity generation capacity compared to its needs probably in the world. I don't know. Bulgaria uses 3-4 gigawatt electricity, has 14 gigawatt capacity, generation capacity. The main problem of the Bulgarian government is what to shut down next week. So, but it continues to be about gas. So it is very much about markets and it's not about the resources. Well, these are my just introductory remarks. I think that um, this last conclusion is a very good starting point for our um, conversation because uh, it's actually indeed about a market uh, because one of the markets that is actually absent in the EU is a proper common energy market. The European Commission has moved into their, that, that direction trying to repair that mistake by proposing um, some sort of a strategy um, of building an energy union, um, which uh, maybe surprised many of us in the EU, or maybe not, by not being that ambitious, um, as ambitious like, for example, the banking union, or some other integrational steps that happened in the past five years. What it actually circles on is using the existing legislation and tools to enhance uh, EU's independence, energy independence and um, development of the common market. So I think that um, through the pers that perspective and in view of the um, 
all the previous panels talking about EU foreign policy, the candidate countries, the neighborhood, it's really important to, to talk how ambitious is the, the European Energy Union communication? Is it going to resolve our and our neighborhood's problems? If yes, how? So I would suggest that we focus on these several questions and with the focus that Julian proposed that it's the markets, not the resources. So I, I guess that we should start with Anka Mahalachi. I'm sorry if I'm not pronouncing her name right. Um, with her view on the issue and then we move forward. Thanks. Thank you. Um, to start with, uh, just to introduce myself, I'm Anka Mihalake. I work for an um, energy security think tank in Romania, in Bucharest, Energy Policy Group. Um, to, to begin uh, with, with the energy union, first of all, I think it's important that we understand exactly what the energy union um, stands for, and that is a framework that will hopefully provide, provide a boost to cooperation and coherence between member states uh, in order to address the European Union's energy challenges and priorities. Um, it has started with the, the idea of buying gas together and getting a unique price for gas and negotiating the contracts together. That's what was the um, what everybody was hoping to achieve through this energy union when Mr. Tusk proposed it. Uh, proposed it. Um, in um, honesty, it will probably not achieve this goal because it would go against all the market rules that we are trying to enforce, but um, it will probably help with transparency and making these contracts and these negotiations transparent. And this, this in turn, um, as a corollary to this, is the fact that um, they will eventually comply with the European legislation. At least that is the, the objective of the energy, um, one of the objectives of the energy union. Um, so the way that I see the energy union is more of a political momentum that will, um, a, a thing that will provide political momentum which comes at a very good time right now. But clearly it is not going to be a silver bullet uh, because the, the the silver bullet already exists, and that is imp uh, legislation which is not uh, perfectly implemented or completely being implemented by member states and by energy community uh, states, not just energy, not just European Union states. Still, there is an optimistic note. We do see some implementation of legislation, and it may not be as glorious as other um, as. Russian projects or anything, but we do see legislation working, and this is, uh, for instance, in the Gazprom antitrust uh, file that, that has been uh, the, the process that has been started by the European Union. Or we can also see it uh, in the way that uh, the European Union has managed to handle the South Stream proposal where the big issue was that it was not compliant with the third energy package. And eventually countries did manage to work together with the European Commission so as to try to make it comply. It was then Russia's choice to cancel it when they saw that there is no other option but complying with European legislation. So we do see some th signs of, the, of Brussels moving, moving towards um, implementing its own policies. Um, I did feel, uh, coming to this meeting, I did feel that it's important to talk about uh, what a this failure to fully implement legislation has created, the problems that have uh, arisen, arisen from this. And in no particular order, I noted some of these problems that states have in the European Union and in the Western Balkans as well as Eastern Partnership countries. Um, they're not much different. The issues are not very different from one another. One of them would be the fact that uh, these states do not have very uh, reliable legislation. You see shifts in legislation which are creating a very unstable environment for investment. And you see this a lot in Romania where um, they are just now rethinking the royalties scheme for companies wanting to explore in offshore Black Sea. Or you did see it again in Romania on renewables where uh, a, few, a few years ago we had a boost in renewables thanks to very um, uh, good legislation encouraging renewables, but then the government backtracked on that and uh, started to change it, which of course uh, 
caused some some companies, renewable companies, to to go even bankrupt. Um, the other problem that you see is that most projects that are being proposed either re remain on paper or if they do start to be implemented, they take a very, very long time to implement. And, for instance, you have the most obvious example, which is the Giurgiu Ruse, the Romania-Bulgaria interconnector, which started was supposed to be finished, uh, I think, one year ago, but now they are just again re, um, rehiring a company to, to construct the whole thing. And um, also you can see it in the Romania-Hungary interconnector where um, we are still failing to create reverse flow on that. We can only export gas. All of these interconnectors which are seen, which are the highlight of uh, the new European policy, they are being stalled at one point or another, which is one of the problems. Um, another issue is the inward-oriented approach of all the states in the region. You see each country going its own way. For instance, um, everybody wants to be a hub in the region, which is a, quite a, a strange development. Uh, you see Romania uh, sort of stalling on um, playing its part in the whole regional market by ma actually exporting the gas that it has. Um, so you see all of these populist approaches where everybody is focusing on their own country and not so much on working together with the others in order to create an actual region. And then you have the more um, um, problematic geopolitical and security risks. For instance, inside the EU you have the German-Greek divide. Um, plus you see... Um, the Russian control on strategic companies such as uh, refineries when you see this in Serbia uh, on Nice and you see it in Moldova Transgas which is the, the, trans, uh, the TSO in uh, Republic of Moldova, the gas transmission operator. Uh, um, and you see it also for instance in a refinery in Romania, in a Luke oil refinery in, uh, in Romania. And then you have actual security risks and you see this in Georgia where pipelines are um, being threatened now, security of pipelines is being threatened by encroachment of Russian troops. Um, and you see it also maybe not so clearly, but uh, in the fact that domest domestic uh, exploration and production activity is being hindered by foreign interest, to say so. And you have, we have seen this clearly with shale gas in Romania. It was a lot of the shale gas failure in Romania was a lot of the fault of the government, but you cannot help but wonder if it was really just the government that failed there or maybe there was something more that created all that protest. Then you see a lot of uh, corruption, you see a lot of populism, uh, all of these nationalistic approaches that I was talking about. And you see, a, a, for instance, this is very obvious in Romania, the, the government clearly mistakes energy independence with energy security. Um, okay. You can see also some double standards being applied. Uh, for instance, the new deal between OMV and Shell to create a, a, two new pipelines, part of Nord Stream, and, but then pushing Greece for diversification and finding alternatives. Um, so the, these are the... Ah, then you see also technical issues. For instance, the fact that the grid, uh, there is... Um, we have different perimeters between grids for electricity, for instance, between Romania and Republic of Moldova. And this also needs to be addressed. Um, so these are the, mainly the, the big issues that the European uh, Energy Union should focus on. But to, to end on an optimistic note, there, have been some, there has been some progress and um, there has been created a group, a regional work, working group uh, for Central and Southeastern Europe, which has started to work very focused and very um, on, on particular projects. And this is, uh, this is encouraging because clearly Brussels realized that having the money, they have the power to, to actually organize, the, not organize, but uh, draw the main lines in the region and then help uh, states work together. So that's a promising uh, step. Thank you. Thank you for being uh, brief and concise. Um, I think that we should um, pass on to Ki Chi. <coughs> Okay, um, and to talk about Ukraine in view with um, 
the energy union, and um, obviously we have many problems within the EU, but how is this, how can this be put into context for Ukraine and energy, energy security? Well, okay, thank you very much, um, first of all, uh, for inviting me to and having me here, and I would like to especially thank ECFA for supporting me last year to write a wonderful brief which uh, you can find outside. It's about the Ukraine gas and why we should support Ukraine gas reform. Um, I should note that um, as an economist, an applied economist, actually the policy brief is based on a lot of numbers and modeling. So place all the statements there are based on real numbers. So it's not just a policy brief. It's more than that. So... Um, um, I'm coming from Cambridge, but um, I'm originally uh, from Vietnam, was, grew up in Ukraine, and moved to UK. So it's, it's a bit of confusion who am I here representing what. Uh, so, um, and I'm in, um, my disclaimer is that I'm energy economist, I'm applied economist, so um, um, I have been uh, attending a lot of these uh, conferences with uh, scholars uh, on the foreign policy and international relations, so I have learned a lot from you uh, and uh, political correctness of some of the statements that, that economists might uh, say on the energy security in Europe. So I'll try to be politically correct. And um, at the dinner, I'll be incorrect. Um, so I, I would like to agree with uh, Julian's remark that, um, you know, when people talk about the energy security in Europe, they, think, they immediately think about the gas security. And I would like to go one step further and say that when they think about gas security, they think about Ukraine. That's Ukrainian-Russian gas relationship. Um, and at the end of my remark, I also would like to uh, ask you one question because I'm, I'm learning a lot from you, so... Um, Bear with me on that. Um, so I'm going to talk about the energy um, causes and the consequences of Ukrainian energy um, and, and the crisis. So, uh, and I have really two remarks here, and I think that you can um, find details in the policy brief that, I, that we wrote last year. So Ukraine's energy, and in particular gas, landscape is very, very complicated, and one needs to look from the bottom up of what is happening in Ukraine over time, 24 years. And it is a mix of two or three things, at least. The historical and technological issue to do with, in particular, with the gas system. So the gas system has been inherited from the Soviet Union. It was designed in mind as a single system that synchronized the operational mode of exportation of Russian gas. And it used to also transport Ukrainian gas to Moscow. And then the Western Siberian fields have been developed, and we see a lot of gas coming from Russia through Ukraine to uh, European countries. And as a single system, without borders of the Soviet Union at that time, the technological issue is that most of the gas storages are in the western part of Ukraine because gas is very depends on the weather. If it is very cold, you, have, you need a lot of gas. And you cannot afford to build infrastructure that is so large that could accommodate gas consumption during the January days in the eastern part of Ukraine, for example. Therefore, you need gas storages, large gas storages. But they, for some reason, has been built in the western part of Ukraine, near Uzhgorod. While the gas consumption in Ukraine is in the east, so most of the energy in the intensive industries that consume a lot of gas are in the eastern part of Ukraine. A lot of chemical plants, a lot of steel plants. The urbanization in the east of Ukraine is one of the highest region compared to the southern part, central, and of course the western part of Ukraine. Now most of 
the pre-crisis GDP in Ukraine has been generated by the metal industry, the chemical industry. They generated about 40 to 50 percent of all the exports in Ukraine. These two industries also consume a lot of gas. They consume about 40 percent of gas that flows into Ukraine. And most of this gas consumption, as I said, is in the eastern part of Ukraine. So there is a mismatch between when the winter comes, you need storages near the consumption center, but you don't have them. This is a complication where the, where the real technical security of supply issue is at the moment. And recently, Ukraine has, um, well, the prime minister of Ukraine, Mr. Yesenyuk, has written a letter to the European leadership asking for help to open up the virtual, sort of virtual reverse flow from Slovakia back to Ukraine. So now Ukraine importing gas physically. So gas comes from Russia all the way from the eastern part of Ukraine. It goes to Slovakia and then it goes back to Ukraine. So there's a lot of inefficiency in that. So what Ukraine is proposing is, well, actually, if you give us, if we synchronize, let's say, I'm, I'm just going to um, use this word synchronize, but be, there are a lot of technical regulatory issues there. But if you can say, synchronize the two systems in Slovakia and in Ukraine, you can actually do the swap, which is called the contractual swap, allowing actually Ukraine to take the European gas in the eastern border. In my mind, that could help and solve the security supply problem because then you don't need a lot of gas to transport and store in the storages. I think that neither the Prime Minister of Ukraine nor Nafta Gas, who is responsible for gas transportation and distribution of gas, understand this basic issue. What they have in their mind is a very short-term problem to find finances to have the lowest possible importation prices uh, that they could afford to survive the next winter. But that is not the point. The point of having a virtual reverse flow and contractual swap is actually to use less gas, physical gas transportation. That could solve our problem, I think. And that has never been discussed before in the public domain. And as I said, I think I'm, I'm not sure whether Ukrainians understand that fully. And they could say that more explicitly, probably. But what they are championing on the ground, oh, we need to have a lower prices. That's one issue. Um, well, of course, the second issue is, as you understand, the, um, the energy-intensive industries in Ukraine generates a lot of cash and GDP. And it also depends a lot on the Russian gas. So therefore, Russian energy policy in Ukraine, and in particular the gas pricing policy, affects the whole Ukrainian economy. And of course, the politics. The regional politics, because you have East, you have West, you have cultural differences, you have differences in the economy, in the economic structure. The East generate, or used to generate, that's another question, used to generate a lot of cash and GDP, but it also depends on Russian gas, and in particular the pricing. And I was wondering why on earth 24 years has passed, and, and I have witnessed a lot of governments in Ukraine who could not do anything about diversifying its basic economic structure. I'm not talking about even diversifying gas consumption or importation of gas from Europe. I'm talking about the basic stuff of putting your economy onto the right wheels, diversifying away from the raw material-based economy, which again depends on Russian gas. And half of the products, the metal, the chemical products, actually ship back to Russia. You are like a warehouse for the Russian stuff. You, you depend on the Russian gas, cheap gas, expensive gas. You depend on the markets for the stuff that generates the whole cash and the prosperity of your 
population. And I'm not sure whether the, the, the current government understands that. It, it's, it leaves, and I understand, I mean, if your country, or my country is torn apart, um, it, it needs, it, it's, it's had a very short-sighted view. It needs to find cash again and again. But the bigger picture, and the question probably is, so what, you know, the industrial base in the East is probably half destroyed. What is the economic model for development of Ukraine? You have West, which is very agricultural base. And you used to have East, which is very industrialized. You could have used the industrialization in the East to boost further innovation and grow into the service sector-based economic growth model. But that has never been done. I do rem recall that when I was back in the Ukraine 2001-2002, um, um, in the National Academy of Science, there was this fashionable world, innovation-based economy, so innovation-based growth economy. But that has never been properly developed. So um, with that remark, I think I would like to stop here and... Um, have a lot of questions. All the things that you've said are really interesting and uh, made me think how possible it is Ukraine to serve as an example of how the energy union would work in the EU because the interconnectors that we never managed to, to complete in our part of the region actually worked uh, through Slovakia, is that right? Um, and also the diversity and the different problems that Ukraine itself has. Uh, could this serve as a role model? How would the energy union, as it is presented, work? Sure, sure. Well, I think that if you have tanks on the eastern border, then probably you'll open the, all the pipelines immediately. That's one issue with the reverse flow and how quickly they could do it. But I think that the, the issue of reverse flow has been before the crisis. I mean, back in Yanukovych government 2012, 2013, there was already... Um, first importation of gas from Germany back to Ukraine through Poland. And that was out of economic necessity. The Yanukovych regime suddenly realized that the Russians are going to charge the market-based prices. And therefore, they urgently were seeking for other alternatives. Because the economy is not going to survive $450 per thousand cubic meters as a base price of the Russian gas contract to Russia to Ukraine, which is one of the, well, the, which is the, the, the most expensive gas contract you, would, you could ever have in Europe. Um, in terms of the energy union and whether it might work or might not work and, and Ukraine is a, is a case study or example, well, I think that, you know, one of the suggestions for strategy review would be to help Ukraine to build institutional capacity to do the reforms. There is a lack of institutional capacity. No one understands. No, well, in Ukraine now, or any sort of European countries, the solu if you would ask, what is the solution to energy security? Everyone would say, oh, interconnectedness, you have built into internal energy market. So if you move from the Western Europe to the Eastern Europe, pr I would probably guess that uh, the Western European Council would understand more what, what building the internal market is about because the, these, the West and Northwestern European countries are the only, is the only region where you have liquid market, where you have trading, where we have well-functioned market. And as you move towards the East, there's no market liberalization in Poland, in Romania, in Bulgaria. So why, why people talking about shale gas? It, shale gas in, in Eastern Europe for me, it's like Russian pipe dreams. It's a shell dream in, in Eastern Europe because um, the, the markets comes first and then the shale gas comes second because shale gas is a very specific and difficult resource to develop. Without a liquid market, one cannot develop shale gas. That's for sure. That's period. Okay, thank you very much. I, I'd like to move... Um to the other east, um, to Oktai Tanrisever. Did I get it right? Yeah. 
Okay. Uh, thanks. Um, same question to you, the energy union and the um, development in your part of the world. Yeah. Um, I think uh, uh, to, uh, closer cooperation between Turkey and the EU in the field of energy uh, could contribute to um, the energy union, European energy union, and also strengthen European uh, foreign policy in this uh, region, uh, in the Southeast Europe. Uh, but for reasons other than the dominant narratives suggest, according to the dominant narratives in EU and Turkey, uh, it is all uh, based on um, uh, pipeline politics. In the EU, we have this uh, well-known narrative of uh, using southern corridor, southern energy corridor, uh, to uh, as an alternative to uh, dependence on Russia, but. Uh, this corridor is not likely to provide Russia, uh, EU with the sufficient amount of gas that would reduce this need for Russian gas. I think uh, EU uh, <coughs> uh, could use uh, energy union uh, and the market mechanisms, as Julian uh, mentioned, uh, uh, to uh, force Russia uh, and depoliticize. Uh, the gas trade uh, with Russia in these countries. Uh, this is likely thing, but uh, for the foreseeable future, uh, I think uh, EU will uh, import uh, gas mainly from Russia. Uh, and the uh, Turkish alternative is likely to be very uh, minimal because the TANAP project um, is likely to generate only 16 BCM and Turkey promised to buy 6 BCM, so uh, Southeast European countries will import only 10 BCM, which is nothing as compared to the gas uh, coming from Russia. Uh, that would be important uh, to solve these crisis management uh, cases. I mean, at times when there's a problem between Russia and transit countries, then this uh, southern corridor could uh, contribute to European energy security, but um, not as much as uh, this uh, dominant narrative suggests. Turkish narrative is also quite uh, mistaken because um, that also weakens uh, the basis for uh, Turkey's cooperation with EU. Turkey overplays its hand uh, by using the same logic. Uh, emphasizing this importance of this energy corridor, uh, but um, in addition to the limited amount of natural gas uh, uh, which might come from this uh, route, uh, Turkey also seeks to become another Russia, which is very unlikely. I mean, uh, its strategy uh, and its decision not to join uh, European commun energy community is also based on this uh, mistaken understanding of its role and its potential. Uh, so my suggestion uh, is different, but uh, I believe uh, Turkey could cooperate, uh, contribute to European energy uh, security considerably. Uh, first, uh, by transforming uh, Russia's uh, current um, uh, project called Turkish Stream. It is Russian stream. It should be named Russian stream. It aims to lure uh, Turkey and uh, Greece uh, towards Russia. And uh, it's a political project, uh, not only an energy project. Uh, and uh, that needs to be transformed. Uh, Turkey uh, is heavily dependent on Russia. And uh, too much dependence is not good for Turkey and its transatlantic allies. Uh, both European and uh, NATO allies. Uh, so um, Turkey needs to find ways of reducing this dependence on Russia. Uh, but with this project, Russia also became dependent on Turkey and Greece. Uh, and Turkey managed to transform its trade with Russia on the Western uh, pipeline uh, into by transforming that into a spot market. Uh, 
So Turkish private companies can buy Russian gas on spot market. Uh, it introduces competitiveness, and Russia uh, cannot really sign long-term agreements with Turkey and its uh, main uh, gas company, Botaş. Now it needs to deal with private companies. Uh, it uh, contributes to, to reduction in gas price. I think the same can happen in Turkish stream project. Uh, if uh, uh, the 50 BCM natural gas uh, is uh, traded on the spot market, uh, probably Russia uh, will be forced to reduce uh, the price of natural gas compared to other uh, pipelines like Nord Stream because uh, <clears throat> in the spot market uh, uh, natural gas or conventional natural gas has alternatives like LNG. Uh, so uh, reduction in global LNG market and also uh, shale gas. I'm not really as pessimistic as my colleague uh, regarding shale gas, maybe there is not uh, enough potential in Eastern Europe to develop it, but uh, U.S. shale revolution, I think, will reduce uh, uh, natural gas prices globally, and this will also uh, weaken Russia's bargaining power, and uh, East European countries, especially the Southeast European countries, might be able to buy Russian gas at a cheaper price. So, uh, in energy security, important thing is to have access to energy at affordable price. As long as you have money to pay for gas, then it is an ordinary commodity. As long as Russia needs to sell it, then it is also dependent on that market. So, that interdependence could be managed. Uh, so, Turkey and Greece uh, collectively... Uh, uh, create conditions uh, that might be helpful for uh, Southeast European countries and ensure their energy security. I would like to also talk briefly about, uh, uh, and also I would like to say that um, the demand for gas is declining in uh, the Balkans region. And uh, this is visible in the recent uh, withdrawal of stat oil from top projects which is not good news for TANAP and TAP, but uh, uh, it is also, uh, it weakens Russia's bargaining power because uh, they, uh, R Moscow needs to export this gas and uh, uh, may agree to sell it uh, at a reduced price. But Turkey's advantage is elsewhere, not in the pipeline politics, but in its uh, economy, it's the character of its economy. Turkey's need for natural gas does not stem from its need for heating. Natural gas is usually and should be used mostly for heating. But in Turkey, it is used for electricity generation, which is the most expensive way of generating electricity. But it is the easiest one because you can uh, uh, construct these uh, power uh, plants for, for uh, trans, uh, converting natural gas into electricity easily. It is economical uh, to have this uh, infrastructure, but uh, the uh, electricity that the end user consumes uh, could be very expensive. So Turkey is trying to find other alternatives. So uh, the recent, uh, not, all the, not all of these alternatives are desirable ones, uh, like uh, uh, switch to uh, coal-powered uh, plants. This is bad for environment. Turkey also signed contracts with uh, Russia and uh, Japan and uh, uh, France for the construction of nuclear power plants. So this is not also quite... Uh, uh, preferable from environmental point of view. What is more preferable for Turkey and the EU is the growth of renewable sectors, renewable energy sector. I think Turkey has great potential there, both wind energy and uh, solar energy or photovoltaic energy. Uh, uh, but uh, Turkey has the potential but doesn't have technology. 
which is available in European countries, uh, Germany, United Kingdom, and many other uh, countries in Western Europe. Uh, so, uh, these uh, private sectors uh, in Turkey and uh, Europe could join their forces and uh, increase Turkey's potential for electricity generation uh, through renewables. Uh, this will uh, help uh, both Turkey and the region. Uh, for that, Turkey needs to have uh, uh, integration into uh, Southeast European electricity grid. Turkey has already completed the integration uh, in terms of infrastructure, and the uh, market mechanism is already there uh, for trading electricity. Uh, legal framework has been recently uh, completed for uh, even uh, futures trading, uh, long term, it, it introduces long term stability. Uh, but what is missing for Turkey uh, is that it hasn't signed the uh, European uh, Energy Community uh, Treaty. Uh, this is an important uh, weakness on the part of Turkey. I think uh, Turkish decision makers made a mistake. Uh, because of the uh, strategy of becoming a an hub and uh, uh, not becoming a transit country in natural gas, uh, I think shifting emphasis from gas to electricity and joining uh, uh, Southeast European uh, energy community will enhance Turkey's energy security, but also uh, European energy security because um, Turkey's economy is not also quite uh, stable. I mean, its growth rate is not like uh, Chinese growth rate at uh, 8%. It sometimes uh, falls to 3%. Uh, this means that at those times, Turkey will have excess electricity production. So it needs to export it. But at times when its industrial growth increased, then it needs to import electricity from other countries. So uh, having this integrated market with uh, the European countries uh, will be a very uh, good solution for uh, both sides, and uh, it is fully compatible with uh, uh, engaging Turkey closer with the EU. Uh, it could strengthen uh, European foreign policy and also energy union. Uh, in such an environment, I think Russia will have little room for politicizing uh, the uh, gas trade uh, and uh, more emphasis on electricity production and trade in electricity. Uh, deeper integration in that sector with European countries is uh, quite important. I forgot to say that Turkey has also electricity market regulation authority, which ensures uh, the best conditions and competitiveness for all uh, actors, private and public and international. Uh, so this, uh, guarantee, these guarantees also uh, would attract more investment in the renewable sector, uh, and all could benefit. Uh, it's a kind of win-win uh, perspective uh, without having this geopolitical uh, pipeline diplomacy. Thank you. Uh, thank you. And mentioning foreign policy uh, is actually very close to, to my next question, um, which will, with which we'll make another round with the panelists and then open up uh, for a discussion. Um, in the past years, the um, EU has always um, said and assured that in terms of Russia, that it shouldn't turn energy gas or whatever into uh, a foreign policy tool. But in the same time, in the energy union communication, um, the Commission is actually talking about energy diplomacy. So obviously, um, energy is starting to get into EU's foreign policy as long as it is there in being something common. So is foreign policy or should foreign policy, uh, energy be part of foreign policy? Um, 
we may call it energy diplomacy or we may call it for what it is? Or should it stay out as you've um, finished that geopolitic, geopolitics and things should stay out of this? So I think we should go back to ANCA um, with that and then make another round. Yes, yeah, sorry, I have a two finger. May I? Uh, because it's 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 uh, quite late, and I think we're coming closer to dinner. And it's very, as somebody said, it's even more dangerous to be between to stand between people and dinner than between people and coffee. Uh, I suggest maybe we attach to this question of yours, which is very important, a round, and then we we give the panel the last word and we close it if that's okay with everybody. Yeah, and unfortunately, um, Oktai has to leave us. I'm really sorry about that, but yeah. Something we said. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. I need to catch my uh, flights. So. Yeah, we're very sorry too. Um, okay, so we're opening with that question of mine, which I really insist being <coughs> answered. Um, Anka. Yes, sure. Thank you. Just a very, very brief answer. Um, energy should always be about the market. It shouldn't be about geopolitics because then we get to the Ukraine crisis and all of this. But already it has been pointed out clearly by Oktai. And um, before that, uh, that's the main thing, that you have legislation that actually works and that markets are functional. And uh, just to point out uh, regarding liberalization, this is a, project, a process which is dragging on indeed, but it's very important and I have the feeling that countries in this region are actually starting to understand this. It's been pointed out many, many times by Western European countries the, how important um, trading gas is and how you have functional gas hubs in the West. And this is something that I feel that the Central and, uh, Central and Eastern and Southeastern Europe is actually finally understanding, and you can see this in Romania where half of the gas market is actually liberalized, the one involving industrial consumers. It's just that the household consumers uh, market that hasn't yet been um, liberalized, but it is ongoing. The process will end in 2021 at the latest. So um, markets are being, um, are being granted their um, very important role in energy issues, which dims the role of geopolitics. Thank you, Anka. Sinan there. I wish Oktai was here uh, because I, I slightly disagree on one of his uh, contentions, and that's you know where he says that Turkey uh, made a mistake by not being uh, a party to the uh, Southeastern European Economic, commun uh, economic Community, right? Uh, the reason, and here, again, I go back to what I said in my panel, there's a paradox. The reason why Turkey didn't want to be part of that is that Turkey believes as a country that's, that's negotiating its accession that its adoption of the energy key should be part of the accession process. Uh, you know, that might sound natural to many of you, but that's the position. Whereas if Turkey had, to, had acceded the, uh, the energy community treaty, the energy community, that would have meant that, like Serbia, for instance, the countries that are non-EU members essentially uh, agree, commit themselves to adopt the EU acquis in energy, even if this is not going to lead to accession. So, uh, and the, the peculiarity in the Turkish case is that the energy chapter is, blo is blocked by Greece. So Turkey is saying, look, if you want us to adopt the energy key, unblock the energy chapter and we'll do it. Thank you. Um, other interventions? Yeah, please. Uh, yeah, okay. Irina. Thank you. I have a couple of questions to Chief. Uh, firstly, uh, you mentioned the, um, the fact that Ukrainian economy is more like um, resource-based. That's true, yeah. But uh, how do, what do you think is the potential of the association agreement to change this? I guess this is the idea behind also, right, to change the structure of the economic production. Uh, second question, um, uh, I don't know whether it's, uh, I mean, you mentioned the possible possibility of buying this virtual EU gas on the eastern border. But do we need meter for the, meters for that? Because I think there was a discussion about meters on the Ukrainian-Russian border already a long time ago, and I think it has not been followed up. 
uh, so we don't really know, right, about the flows. Um, and uh, another question, uh, how do you do assess this um, uh, natural law, law reform, which was launched in Ukraine not so long ago? Some intermediate companies were uh, eliminated, and the government argues that it was, um, it's, a, it's important as an element of fighting corruption, and then the price in the reform took place, yeah, and subsidies for poors, uh, poor. So how do you assess the whole complex of reforms, uh, particularly as a um, uh, fighting corruption element? Yeah, and that would be interesting for me. Thank you very much. I think that it's better if Chi would answer and then uh, go for other questions. Okay, uh, let's combine them then. Okay. I have a question which is to Kong, both to Kong and to Uktai, and because Uktai is not there, Sinan, please, you will have to answer, sorry. Uh, do you think that the Iran deal is... Uh, um, a game changer vis-a-vis uh, -vis the whole energy security uh, complex. Um, is there a way to revive Nabucco? And uh, uh, what it would mean uh, for Russia and what would it mean for Turkey? Um, uh let, I think that maybe um, Chi would answer first because there were many questions to him and then, yeah. You know. Very difficult questions. <coughs> well, on the first question, on the potential accession agreement and um, <coughs> changing the structure of UK, Ukraine's economy, I don't know the answer to that question. It's a very complex question. Perhaps if someone would like to fund the research, I'm happy to do that. So um, that is the, the answer to the first question. But I mean, the, the, the experience tells me that, you know, um, so back in 2000, when the whole world economy was growing, booming, the metal prices uh, were growing, um, we couldn't do anything. So um, perhaps with the crisis, we could do something. But that, that depends on really what Ukraine thinks in terms of the selling points of the world. I mean, um, if, would it uh, come back to um, the, uh, the metal and chemical and the mining sector in the east of Ukraine? Perhaps not. What are the alternatives then? Uh, Agricultural-based economy? Uh, because uh, I'm, I'm not an expert on this. Uh, I haven't looked at the access, uh, accession agreement and what it tells you, but it's probably imposing some sort of like market-based institutional building of the market economy, but you know, come on, market economy is market economy. You need to have a resource base, be it intellectual resource base or all the coal mines and corruption, etc. So it's, it's an open question. So, but I'm happy to do research if you want. Uh, on the re reverse, uh, virtual reverse flow uh, and metering, um, that is an interesting question because uh, I believe that you probably need metering at the eastern border of Ukraine because then you would know what is the actual flow from the Russia because you cannot trust the Russians. So the short answer is probably yes. The, the, the important question is why the hell Ukraine hasn't been doing this for 24 years and relying on the Russians to, to tell the numbers of the flows. So... Yeah, probably, of course. I mean, um, everything now goes to EU as a mediation. So the, uh, Mr. Shevchevich now has another role in mediating the Russia-Ukraine the gas talks. So, um, yeah, we can add a list to Mr. Shevchevich to, to deal with that as well. On the natural gas, I think the law, right, you're talking about, the, the new law. Uh, well, uh, honestly, I haven't looked into that into detail, but... Uh, well, my, my perception of the pricing reform is it's very politically um, difficult in Ukraine. So um, uh, I believe that I've uh, heard that Timoshenko is uh, challenging again about the rises in energy tariffs. So the, 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 the energy prices again in Ukraine is a, is a very um, political question, I guess. And 
the, the, the obvious solution to the, to, the, to the state deficit and to the deficit of nafta gas, which is an oil and gas company, is that uh, the, the situation is as follows. Nafta gas buys uh, ra from Russia and Europe uh, at the very high prices and still sells at under the, uh, uh, the importation costs. And the, the, the difference has to be met either by the state uh, deficit uh, or the state uh, uh, transfer between the state budget and uh, the budget of nafta gas. So that is... Uh, and I understand that that is one of the preconditions for IMF to continue to support Ukraine is actually to close the, uh, the, the gas deficit uh, and the state deficit in terms of gas financing by 2017. How realistic is that? I'm not sure. Uh, Ukraine has been defaulting on IMF uh, conditionalities 2010, 2012. So um, let's hope that when your country is torn apart, you'll do something good. Uh, on the Iranian deal, um, the, the, the question is not about the game changer or not. It's, it's about when. When is a very important question. So um, my colleague says that the Romanian gas uh, industry or liberalization will have a deadline in 2021. They've got to know that in six years we'll see Romanian gas market liberalized, hopefully. Um, so the question about Iran is rather long-term, I think. Because even if the sanctions are lifted, you need to develop the industry infrastructure, be it pipeline or LNG facilities to ship gas to the global market. Um, speculations, five, ten years at best. The second question is the growing gas demand in Iran as well as a second issue. Between the, the, the trade-off between uh, meeting the demand domestically or selling outside. In terms of the mode of the transportation, whether it be pipeline to uh, through Turkey, people are saying very unrealistically, probably it would go first as an LNG project because there are some frozen projects uh, between Total and the Iranian uh, gas company to develop the LNG. So... Hopefully, we will see LNG as the first uh, uh, projects of Iranian gas to Europe and to the glo global markets. Uh, I don't want to push you. I know that a lot of questions were put forward to you, but um, it's really um, a matter of um, starvation, I guess, for many people. Yes. Um, so I'd like uh, Sinan to answer his part of the questions, and then we wrap up because I really think that it's cruel to talk about energy when everyone's hungry, yeah? On Iran, I don't have much to add. Uh, the, initial, the initial game will be on oil, and the impact will be on the oil market, as we've already seen, uh, indeed. For gas, it's a more long-term play. Uh, there needs to be new investments. Uh, Iran is also using its own gas, not only for its industry, but also for its oil, to get oil out. Uh, so there is, you know, it's going to take quite a while before Iran becomes a major exporter of natural gas. But it has the potential to be, given where it stands in terms of, you know, its reserves. It's one of the biggest. Uh, so, but that's more long term. So initially, I don't see it as a, much as of a, gain, a game changer, to tell you the truth. It will be more game changer in terms of geopolitics, regional issues, more than the energy equation. Nabucco, um, you're beating a dead horse there um, in the sense that uh, because of the you know, many strategic blunders uh, around Nabucco, uh, now that project has been superseded by another one, which is in a way simpler, uh, TANAP, uh, and they both basically address more or less the same sources of gas, uh, which is from the Azeri uh, Caspian fields. Uh, so you can't have both at the same time. And now TANAP is going forward uh, so uh, with, with interconnection to Europe. And, you know, so there's no way to resuscitate uh, Nabucco under these circumstances. Uh, the two are mutually exclusive. You had a third question, which I can't recall right now, Vesela. That was it? Okay. All right. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to thank you all very much. Um, I guess that some of you might be disappointed, but I believe that 
Um, you can ask your questions later at dinner. And for everything, blame Miss Mogherini. She really spoke a lot of it. It was interesting, wasn't it? Uh, so, very nice evening to you all. Thank you for being here. Thank you for inviting me as well. So, hope to see you again sometime.